on listen only mode. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webcast, Closing the Door on Web Shells. My name is Trevor and I will be moderating this webcast. Today's featured speaker is Anuj Sony, a senior incidents responder. Before I turn things over to our speaker, the Q&A portion will take place at the end of the webcast. Please feel free to submit your questions at any point by using the questions window. Right now, I'd like to turn things over to Anuj. All right. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Anuj Soni. I'm a senior incident responder, as Trevor mentioned, uh, for Booz Allen Hamilton, where I help perform intrusion investigations, uh, including forensic and malware analysis. I'm also an instructor for the SANS Reverse Engineering Malware course. And today I'd like to talk to you for the next hour or so um, about a type of malware that I don't think gets enough attention. To start off the discussion, I'm going to place a script here on the screen for you to take a look at. And as an analyst, I'd like you to assume you found this script on a public phasing server. And your goal is to determine what it allows an attacker to do if they browse to a page with this code. Now to make it just a bit easier to digest, I'm going to clean it up here. Now I'd like you to take a moment and try and understand at a high level what this is capable of doing. This is in fact a fully functional Java-based web shell. It checks if the parameter f is not equal to null. If it's not null, it creates a new file name with a value equal to the parameter f, and it writes to that file the contents of the parameter d. If you found this on a public facing server, it could be used by an adversary to arbitrarily create files on the box. So you could be dealing with a pretty serious compromise. Now at around 170 characters or so, it's fairly small, but very dangerous. And rest assured, web shells can get much, much smaller and much more capable. Now this could be considered a first stage web shell in that it could allow an attacker to then upload a more capable one. So even if you knew you were compromised with a web shell, Finding this code may not be trivial. It could be, if you're fortunate, in a fully contained file, or it could be lurking in an otherwise perfectly legitimate page, waiting for someone to visit it with just the right parameters. Do you see the web shell? There it is. All right, so why web shells? Now, I fully understand they have been around for years, but they continue to be used to cause serious harm by attackers and I don't think they get the attention that they deserve. I think that's justification for at the very least, at the very least for their discussion. Now RAFs are remote administration tools uh, which have similar functionality to web shells, get all the press. Uh, but web shells, in my opinion, are more impressive. They can be much smaller in size while maintaining much of the same functionality. Uh, they're platform independent since they focus on web technology. They also don't use traditional command and control. So rather than beaconing out, the attacker usually browses to a page on the public facing server that's compromised, uh, making it hard to separate them from the numerous other web requests being served. Tons of configuration options uh, you can all, allow you to uh, make modifications to these web shells, which also make them hard to detect. And as a result, AV vendors have a tough time keeping up uh, with the changing environment of web shells. So if you've seen one or analyzed one before, you might be OK. But if you haven't taken a close look at this type of malware, you just might miss it. So there are a number of topics uh, that I want to discuss today. We'll cover a brief overview of what web shells are and why they're dangerous. And we've already touched on this a bit. Uh, most importantly, we'll discuss strategies you might consider to detect and analyze them. Now, I do also want to be clear about what I won't be discussing today. We're not going to discuss how to develop web shells or hack systems to, to get them there. Frankly, and granted I'm biased, I think that's the easy part. The challenge is finding them once they're there. So this talk is going to focus on describing the problem from an incident responder's perspective. Also, I should mention the standard disclaimers. Uh, none of the information I'm presenting here is client specific. Uh, much of it was generated by me in a test environment. Uh, but if you're interested in repeating my work, uh, please feel free to contact me. I do have some resources at the end of the slides. Um, but I'm happy to direct you to more uh, if you'd like to do your own testing. So the web shell architect architecture we're going to discuss uh, is fairly straightforward. We have a public facing server. <clears throat> we also have an attacker who, for whatever reason, has no chin. Uh, the attacker takes advantage of any number of publicly available vulnerabilities to exploit the box and place a web shell there. Now, web shells can come in all shapes and forms, uh, written in almost any server-side scripting language you can imagine. 
Uh, there's ASP Shell, JST, PHP, Perl, Python, you name it. Now, once the web shell is up and running, uh, the attacker can then use it to do such things as create files, uh, execute arbitrary commands, access backend databases, or, as in many serious cases, exfiltrate sensitive information. Now, I should mention there are other web shell architectures that could be used. You could have a thick client where the server-side code is even smaller, uh, but the attacker has a GUI or command line front end on their machine. Uh, we'll touch on both types during the course of this webcast. Uh, also, I have one server listed here in the center, uh, but you certainly could have many with a complex architecture that includes load balancers and all sorts of other unknowns uh, that can make both the attacker's job and our job as investigators much more challenging. So just a few words on how web shell is delivered to a target. When it's delivered from the outside, as I mentioned before, an attacker can use any number of vulnerabilities and exploits in web technology. Uh, those include such things as remote file inclusion or SQL injection. Now from the inside, you may have a malicious insider who wants to provide themselves with external access or an advanced threat who's already pillaged your internal network uh, and wants a web shell as a backup for persistent access. These are just some web shells that you may have heard of in recent years. China Chopper and Deep Panda got quite a bit of press during the past year, and I have some links to some great articles at the end of the deck here. Uh, C99 is a PHP uh, shell that's uh, been used for well over a decade. So, like I said before, they've been around for quite a while. Now, I want to move on to a couple web shell examples uh, in the context of a case that occurred in the fall of 2013. This is completely public, so you're welcome to read about this on your own time some more if you like. Uh, but the basic background is this. Uh, JBoss, as you may be aware, is a Java-based application server called Wildfly, Wildfly now, but uh, it was JBoss at the time. In 2011, a JBoss vulnerability was presented at a number of security conferences. Uh, the vulnerability was associated with the HTTP Invoker server. Now, I'm not sure why it took so long, but in September 2013, uh, NIST assigned a CVE number to the code execution vulnerability in certain HP products uh, that utilize JBoss. And in October 2013, a security researcher developed and released proof-of-concept PHP code to actually exploit that vulnerability. As you might guess, within a short period of time, uh, there appeared an increase in JBoss hacking as people used that proof-of-concept code against any vulnerable servers uh, that they could find. Now, the proof-of-concept code that was released in order to demonstrate what was possible uh, not only exploited the vulnerability, but it took advantage of that vulnerability to deploy a JSP web shell that allowed those who access it to execute arbitrary commands, similar to the example I showed you earlier. Now let's dive a bit deeper into this example, and let me describe to you how this worked. <clears throat> so to, to run the proof of concept exploit code, uh, you would run the PHP script noted at the top of the slide. You'd provide it with two arguments. First, the IP of the target machine you wanted to exploit. And second, the command you wanted to run on that machine after the web shell was up and running. In this case, the target's a Linux box, and the command ID prints user and group information. So the flow of events uh, would follow like this. Uh, we have an attacker and a public-facing server, just as we did before. Now, upon running this PHP script, the exploit would execute on the target machine. I'm not going to show it here because it's obviously rather large and not really the focus of this presentation. But in step two, after a successful exploit, the code then reached out to another server and downloaded a web shell in the form of a WAR file. The code snippet at the top specifies the location of the shell in the form of a WAR file. I mean, WAR file is basically a package format used to distribute a collection of Java server pages. Now, contained within that WAR file was a file called pwn.jsp, pwn.jsp, which is the actual web shell. So then in step three, the PHP code running on the attacker's machine submits an HTTP request to the web shell now running on the server specifying the command to execute. Again, in this case, that command is ID. The snippet at the bottom shows the code used to build the get request to pwn.jsp, and the CMD parameter will contain the actual command to execute. Again, that command is ID. So at a high level, that's how this proof of concept code is working. Now, this is an excerpt of the actual pwn.jsp code that would reside on the public-facing server waiting for an attacker to submit the appropriate HTTP request with the right parameters. I just wanted to highlight a few areas here. The CMD parameter, again, contains the command to actually execute. And here it's going to check to make sure that that parameter is not equal to null. The next chunk of code determines that the target machine is a Windows box 
or something else and uses the appropriate shell to execute the command. It then runs the code and finally collects the results to be displayed to the attacker. From the attacker's end, it might look like this. Uh, here, in my own test environment, I'm running pwn.jsp, and you'll notice in the address bar and in the larger text down below that I'm requesting pwn.jsp with the command ls slash etsy. If I ran this command as is, I would get the following result in the browser. It's basically a listing of the files within my target machine's etsy directory. And let's move on to take a look at what this might look like on the network. So using Wireshark, I captured the following traffic. And we can see, first, the GET request being sent, and also the response. Now, there are probably no surprises here, but I wanted to make clear using a simple example um, what a shell looks like on the server, and as well as what it looks like across the wire. Now, moving on, as a result of the publicly disclosed JBoss vulnerability I mentioned earlier, and a proof of concept code that was released, I mentioned there was an increase in JBoss exploits that placed own.jsp on target systems. But in addition to that, there was a number of cases where the incident resulted in the placement of a more sophisticated web shell called JSP spy. In this way, the simple pwn.jsp was a first stage web shell used to then upload a more advanced one. So next, I'd like to provide you with an overview of the capabilities associated with JSP spy uh, by walking through some screenshots. Now, the screenshots I'm going to show are from my test environment, uh, where I installed a publicly available version of JSP spy. Now, obviously, an attacker would probably want to use a different file name, but for simplicity, we're going to stick with jspspy.jsp. Uh, my target machine acting as the publicly available server that uh, used the Remnox malware analysis distribution that was created by Lenny Zelcher. Uh, and I also had Apache 2 and Tomcat 7 installed. Now, I should mention that while my observations are based on analyzing activity on Linux servers, uh, this guidance certainly applies to Windows environments as well. OK, so moving on with some of these screenshots, uh, I'd like you to, to note uh, what JSP Spy looks like when you first navigate to it. You're actually going to encounter a very simple initial login screen. Uh, entering in the appropriate login information, uh, you'll see quite a bit of capability. We'll start with a page here called File Manager. You can see it shows you a directory listing of files and provides the ability to edit, download, or move them in addition to browse to other locations. Moving along to some of the other functionality, this page is called Database Manager. And you can use it to log into any accessible backend databases and start actually performing queries. Now, in several cases, we've seen a username and password credentials for these backend databases literally sitting on the public facing server in a text file. So getting these credentials isn't necessarily difficult. Uh, next, we have the Back Connect page, which provides the ability to shovel a shell back to the attacker. And we also have a port scan page. This allows you to essentially perform port scans on the local network. So if the attacker has their shell on a public facing server and now wants to enumerate the DMZ and possibly search for other services to exploit, well, they can do that using this port scan feature. The download remote file page, as you might guess, allows the attacker to reach out to a third party server and download a file to this target machine. The execute command is probably the most dangerous of all these features. It allows you to, as you might guess, execute arbitrary commands on the box. Now, in this case, I've executed, just for test purposes, a cat etsy password. And you can see below that the output is displayed. So now you have an understanding of what this web shell looks like from the attacker's perspective. Uh, let's take a look at the network, as we did before, and touch on how we might even begin to detect this sort of activity. Now, this may look similar to the network traffic we saw with pwn.jsp, but there are a few key differences. First, you'll notice this is an HTTP POST request rather than a GET request. This means that we have to look at the POST data for additional content associated with this request, which you can see there below. In the POST data will see several parameter value pairs separated by an ampersand that are URL encoded. For example, O equals shell, type equals command, and then command equals, well, the actual command we wanted to execute, in this case, cat as the password. Now, if you ran through similar tests across the different functionality that JSP spy allows, you see post data similar to the examples here. And you might notice patterns in the post data and start to understand what some of these parameters mean, even without looking at the actual JSP spy code. As a result of that type of analysis, you could then create possibly an IDS signature using some of these custom strings. 
Now, if you were dealing with a sick client web shell scenario where a front end on the attacker machine sends the request versus a web browser, you could also look for custom user agents to create reliable IDS signatures. But there are additional options as well, possibly what I consider simpler ones. Specifically, even though an attacker can customize many of the strings you saw on the previous page, uh, they may not change other strings that are part of the publicly available web shell. For example, there's actually a copyright notice in addition to a version number associated with the publicly available JSP file. Using that information, uh, this is an example of a snort rule you could use to detect the download of a page associated with JSP spies. So the example on this slide would do the following. It would alert on TCP packets from our web servers to any client that includes the text JSP spy version 2009 where the client initiated a connection. So this would trigger on pages when the attacker actually accesses a page associated with JSP spy. Now again, an attacker could change all of these strings. This is just an example. But if you suspect a public web show was used, or even more importantly, if you find one on one of your servers and want to detect other potential compromises quickly, this could be an effective approach. Of course, you'd want to tweak, test, and optimize any signature uh, to reduce false positives. Uh, and things could certainly get more complicated if the traffic is encrypted, uh, but this is certainly an option worth exploring. So we've covered an overview of JSP Spy and its capabilities. We've also touched on what JSP Spy activity looks like on the network and an approach to detecting it. Now I'd like to move on to the host, that is the compromised server, and discuss some detection tools and techniques. An initial approach that might come to mind if we were to find a suspect file is to submit it to VirusPhoto or another AV service. Now for those as gauges as me, it may come as no surprise that it's not detected. In this case, I just submitted the hash for the JSP file that I've been using for these screenshots. Um, now, even if it was detected, remember that web shells are very easy to customize, and so you could make some changes to help avoid detection. While many of these vendors do have a difficult challenge ahead of them when it comes to detecting web shells, uh, due to some pretty clear challenges, uh, there, are, there are, however, some capabilities uh, that are useful to explore, and I want to go through some of those with you now. One is called Linux Malware Detect. Now, it's still an active project, and it has several approaches to detection based on MD5 hashes, uh, hex-based pattern matching, and statistical analysis. In order to, to test this detection capability, uh, I ran it against the pwn.jsp and JSP spy files I mentioned earlier, uh, but unfortunately there were no hits. But I did want to see this tool in action for my benefit and yours. Uh, so I downloaded over a thousand web shells written in a variety of languages, and I scanned that group using Linux Malware Detect. And the results are here. You'll notice in the top red box that it scanned over a thousand files and it had around 270 hits, so it detected about a quarter of them. It does, in fact, hit on some JSP web shells, as you'll see noted, but just not ours. And now, if I go look at the second red box, you'll notice it actually specifies very helpfully why it triggered on a particular file. For many of them here, it was a hex match. For others, it was a hash. And still, in one other case, it was a clan AV signature. So clan AV is actually one of those AV vendors that does a pretty good job of detecting a variety of web shells. Another capability I want to mention is called PHP Shell Detector. Now this one doesn't technically target JSP files, but it's still helpful and you'll see why shortly. PHP Shell Detector uses a signature database to detect potential shells, but it also looks for what it calls suspicious or dangerous functions. Let me show you an example. PHP Shell Detector can be run by a web interface or the terminal. Uh, here I'm running it in a browser. And I'm running it against a PHP web shell called b374k.php. Now, for the purpose of this example, you don't need to know all the details about the shell. Uh, it's quite capable and pretty dangerous. Um, but I want to focus on the capabilities of this tool. At the bottom, you'll notice it did not detect the shell based on a fingerprint or signature. But it did take a look at suspicious functions used. So take a look at this next section that I've highlighted. As you glance across those functions, you'll see that most involve execution or decoding and encoding, which could help detect the shell even if an attacker intentionally tried to avoid signatures. Running the Python script associated with this tool, of course, provides similar results, and this would certainly be easier to script. Now, if you look at the Python associated with shell detect, you'll notice the default is to only analyze PHP, text, and AST pages. But if you make a change and add JSP and then run it again, you'll see it picks up JSP spy 
The reason is because there's overlap between the functions used to execute commands between PHP and JSP. So even though shell detector isn't built for JSP page scanning, it does provide some valuable results. The bottom line here is that in the absence of signatures for a specific web shell, looking for dangerous functions can actually be very helpful. Another capability I wanted to mention is called NeoPy, and it's one that I would recommend considering for scanning web shells as well. While it can use signatures, its key differentiator is that it focuses specifically on obfuscated and encrypted content. So if you had this capability up and running, this is the help output that you would see. And there are a few options I wanted to emphasize. The first is entropy, which measures the randomness of a file. The more obfuscated content a file contains, the higher its entropy will be. The longest word parameter looks for large encoded strings. Uh, this will, for example, uh, trigger on a large base64 encoded blob. It also has two options focused on signatures and some highly specific signatures uh, that have a particularly low false positive rate. So let's experiment with some of these options. In the first test, I executed the entropy test against a directory that included the B374K PHP shell, JSP spy, and some other test files. As you can see, the PHP shell was ranked high on the list because it does contain some encoded data, while the JSP page did not because it doesn't contain that type of information. When I run the signature test, JSP spy rises to the top position with the PHP close behind it. Now, in order to understand why this is the case, let's again look at Python code. The signature nasty function contains the logic used for signature detection. And focusing on the red box here, it's clear that it's essentially looking for dangerous functions, which is similar to the capability we saw before. So this explains the ranking we're seeing and emphasizes the importance of really diving deeper to understand why a tool is triggering on a particular file. So with this strategy in mind, uh, which we've seen several tools take advantage of by now, uh, you could create your own script to search for suspect functions, or even just modify one of the ones we've seen before. Uh, that way you can incorporate what sort of files and functions within those files are normal for your specific environment. I have listed here some of the dangerous functions associated with uh, the version of JSP spy I've been looking at, in addition to some other strings that we've seen before. And at the bottom, I've written a bash script that looks for those search terms on a system, focusing in particular on JSP files. So continuing on with host detection approaches, uh, integrity checking is another approach I wanted to mention that should also be considered uh, because it can help detect modified or newly created files on a system. AID is one I've used successfully before, and it can produce some pretty helpful and simple output, such as what you see on the right-hand side, uh, in this case indicating that a new file was added to a publicly available directory. Apache web logs are invaluable from both a detection and an investigative perspective. Uh, above, on the top of the slide, is an example of some raw Apache web logs captured as a result of using JSP spy to execute the if config command. And I've cleaned it up a bit below. Now there's some helpful information here, such as the date and time of access, and in some cases the attacker IP. What we're missing, however, is the HTTP post data that contains the most important information about the command executed. However, you can overcome this by installing the Apache mod security module that has a number of security enhancements including the ability to capture post data. Realistically, or hopefully rather, you're piping this information into an event log management system for more efficient review. So people like to mention all these tech controls that you could have in place, but often forgetting the most important one, which is, of course, the human. So this is my quick plug for the human, uh, ideally someone with eyes and a face. Um, but producing data like web logs and integrity checking logs uh, will provide zero value if no one is looking at them. All right, so we've discussed uh, network and host detection, but let's dive deeper into some forensics and some things to keep in mind when performing this type of analysis. So to really make the most of forensic analysis of web shells, uh, you need to have an understanding of how the underlying web technologies work. Uh, otherwise, some of the artifacts you see could be misleading. We'll continue with the JSP spy example using Java server pages. So let's go through what happens when a JSP page is actually loaded. In step one, 
an HTTP request for a JSON page is sent to the web server. In step two, the web server recognizes that the request is for a JSP page and it forwards it along to a JSP engine. In step three, the JSP engine loads the JSP page and converts it into a servlet. In step four, the JSP engine compiles that servlet into an executable class file. In step five, the servlet engine loads the servlet class and executes it. And upon execution, the servlet produces HTML output, which is then passed to the web server inside an HTTP response. And finally, in step six, the web server sends that HTTP response to the browser, which renders it as it would any other page. Now, I want to mention that the .java file in step three and the .class file in step four are only recreated if the original .jsp page changes or is modified, not every time the page is accessed. This is extremely important to keep in mind when we perform timeline analysis, and we're going to get into that shortly. So to better describe the artifacts generated when accessing a web shell, uh, we're going to continue with this JSP spy example. And during testing, I started off with just this one file. This is the publicly available JSP spy that I downloaded. And I put it in a file that was ready to be accessed by a browser from another machine. Now, upon browsing to this page for the first time, all of these files are produced. In total, there are about 63. Uh, this is just an excerpt. The files include the JSP spy primary.java and .class files, in addition to what are called inner class files. These basically result when you define a class inside another class. Uh, the essential idea is that they support the overall functionality of the code. Now, without some basic knowledge of how Java server pages work, it might have appeared that the attacker placed or created these files here, uh, but that's clearly not the case. However, the timestamps associated with these produced files can be extremely helpful in determining the timeline of act attacker activity. So now I'd like to run through an example of web shell timestamp analysis. And with an understanding of how JSP pages work, you can start building the timeline of a potential compromise. For so this example, we're going to focus only on M time, which is modified time, and CR time, which is create time. But you'd also want to incorporate C time and A time in a real case. This test was performed on an EXT4 file system, so we do have CR time available to us. All right, so let's get started here. So the primary JSP file has a create time of 1430. I'm not really going to mention the actual days because, as you can tell, they're all the same. So this primary JSP file has a creation time of 1430 and a modified time of 1523. This likely means the attacker uploaded the shell at 1430 and then modified it at 1523. Now the create time for the primary .java and .class file is 1524. This would be the first time the attacker accessed the page after the most recent change made to the JSP file at 1523. The inner class files are also updated at that time, leading to the change on the bottom left, the end time of 1524. Now, here's something that's a bit odd. Note the primary Java and class file modified time of 1523, which is after the respective create times of 1524. I expected the end time for these files to reflect the CR time or a time after. But across repeated tests, the end time for the primary Java and class files reflected the end time of the primary JSP file, even when the first access to the JSP file was after that time. And finally, note the CR time for these inner class files of 1450. This is a new time. Now these files are, were actually already, actually already existed from a previous access. And this most recent access at 1524 didn't require new inner class files to be created since the inner class files were not modified based on the change that was made at 1523. So I know that's, that's a lot of times that were thrown out there. So in summary, uh, this is the story that these timestamps tell. At 1430, the primary JSP file was placed on the system. At 1450, the file was first accessed. At 1523, it was modified by the attacker. And at 1524, the newly modified JSP file was accessed. So I understand that's a lot to digest. 
Feel free to contact me later with additional questions or if you have insight into some of these odd timestamps. But hopefully it's clear that understanding how JSP code is compiled is critical to timeline analysis when dealing with WebShell. So since we've touched on network analysis as well as forensic analysis of web shells, uh, we certainly can't leave out malware analysis. But we've basically been doing that all along. Now I spoke about my test environment for JSP Spy. Uh, we discussed the artifacts it generates upon execution, uh, what type of network traffic it produces, and the various functionality it provides to the attacker. But we can also tie that information into code analysis. And the best part, in my opinion, about analyzing web shells is that once you find them, analyzing them is relatively easy compared to, for example, reverse engineering a Windows executable. That's because if you have a JSP file, you have the source code. You can perform a fairly straightforward review of the features that it provides. For example, you might recall this HTTP post data when the cat Etsy password command was executed using JSP spy. We can now tie that back to the source code that you see below. Very briefly, you can see where it checks for the command parameter, then where that command is actually executed, and where the output is read, and finally output as an HTML page. Now, as you're performing malware analysis of a web shell, there are certainly some key questions you'll try to answer. First and foremost is, what are its capabilities? And again, we've been exploring that all along. But I would argue a more important question is, did it work? If an attacker gets a web shell on a public-facing server, we've seen a number of issues preventing the successful use of that shell. But for example, software dependencies can prevent the code from running. Uh, load balancers may redirect attack traffic to the wrong server. And account privileges may limit the use of dangerous web shell functionality. So any of these complications and others can result in little to no impact. We all know one of the most important goals of incident response is to determine the impact of a potential compromise. I do also want to mention the value of comparing a web shell you discover on a system to those that are publicly available. Any differences between those could give you insight into the sophistication of the attacker and could also assist in creating reliable signatures. Now I do want to briefly run through a final example to give you a broader exposure to web shells. I'll say up front that parts of this may be a bit brief due to time, time constraints, uh, but again, you have access to the recorded webcast afterwards if you want to perform a deeper dive and contact me with any questions. So this next web shell is called WebAQ, and it's interesting for two primary reasons. One, it uses a Perl script to create and connect to a web shell rather than using a web browser. Uh, and two, to evade detection, it encodes the data that it sends and receives and it stores this data in the form of HTTP header cookie fields. We'll go through an example shortly. So after downloading the WebAQ Pro script, you can run the dash H parameter to view its usage as seen here. I want to highlight that you can use a dash G to create a shell that would be placed on the target server, or you can use a dash T to connect to a shell that's already accessible. So if I use a dash G and a dash O to specify the output file, it will create the PHP web shell. This is the web shell it creates. You can tell that there's certainly some obfuscation here. And if I clean it up just a bit, you can see that there's a string rev function, which returns a string reversed. Uh, in this case, it's clear that B would be equal, equal to base64 decode hitting that transmitted data is likely base64 encoded. Uh, below that, we see a string replace operation that, upon completion, is then base64 decoded and executed using the eval function. So one of the WebAQ arguments you may have noticed basically provided the unobfuscated unob version of the show, which you'll see here. We'll touch, touch on this in some more detail shortly, but you can see references to base64 decoding again with operations taking place against parameters stored in the cookie field. So after placing the shell on a target server, we can then use webacu's dash t parameter and dash u parameter for URL to connect to it. We're then presented with a prompt 
uh, the red text you see at the bottom, where we can interact with the compromised system. As we did before, let's take a quick look at the network traffic when we establish this connection. Now, a bit of background. There are two headers that are related to cookies called cookie and set cookie. You'll see them here. One is in the request, and the other is in the response. These headers basically contain data in the form of name-value pairs that you see on the screen. Now, upon establishing a connection, we can then run an example command, such as cat Etsy password. And it does what you would expect. It outputs the contents of the Etsy password file. Again, let's take a look at the network traffic. Now, we see similar network traffic as we did before with name-value pairs in the HTTP get and HTTP response cookie header field, but clearly there's more data here. So let's take a closer look here, starting off with the HTTP GET request cookie header. The CM parameter appears to have some interesting data, and many of you may recognize that string is likely base64 encoded. In fact, if we trace this parameter in the web shell code, and I have that at the bottom of your screen, we can tell that it does get base64 decoded, and the value of the command will actually be, well, cat Etsy password, which is exactly what we can expect. Now, we can similarly track the other parameters in the get request cookie header to determine that CN, which you also see at the top, specifies the parameter that will be returned by the web shell's response, and CP is used as a delimiter. Now, if you're interested in taking a closer look, I'll leave this as an exercise for you to, to track and run through that code. But what's clear is that we can very easily process and understand what each of these parameters is doing. So in summary, web shells can be quite dangerous and, well, difficult to find. But we discussed a number of strategies and tools to detect, investigate, and analyze them. So if your organization doesn't have the capability in place to look for this type of malware, it's definitely worth considering. And hopefully this webcast has provided you with a starting point. Now there are a number of resources I did want to mention. Uh, earlier on, I, I spoke about the Deep Panda web shell and China Chopper. Uh, there's some great articles written by both CrowdStrike and FireEye that I encourage you to take a look at. Also, I mentioned in several cases, I downloaded over a thousand web shells for experimentation. I encourage you to take a look at some of these and perhaps even compare them to what you may have found on your own public facing servers. Uh, those malware Git repositories are mentioned at the bottom of the screen. So at this point, finished a bit early here, I'll open it up to questions uh, with our remaining time. Uh, feel free to reach out to me later using the contact info you see here. Uh, perhaps you have encountered web shells in your own system, perhaps you've encountered different challenges than I've seen, or uh, you've created some of your own solutions. I'd love to hear from you. And so please don't hesitate to contact me after this webcast uh, for more information or uh, to have some further discussion on these topics. And with that, I will turn it back over to Trevor for the Q&A. All right, thank you. We actually have uh, one question today. The question is, during pen tests, web shell embedded and image are uploaded bypassing antivirus in place. So how can we detect if there is an incident? Um, could you repeat that question one more time? No problem. It says, during pen test, web shell embedded and image are uploaded bypassing antivirus in place. So how can we detect if there is an incident? Oh, I see. So in the case that you had uh, a web shell that was embedded in an image file, uh, at that point you'd have to focus on network traffic because even if on the specific host, it becomes difficult to detect it with antivirus or other host-based capabilities. Uh, at some point, if the attacker is going to make use of that web shell, they're going to have to connect to it over the network. And so at that point, I think monitoring network traffic, looking for net flows, um, and slicing and dicing packets is going to be the way to go in the hopes that you can create an effective IDS signature to detect other potential compromises. Good. OK, it uh, looks like we have one more question. What's the most likely cause of a successful web shell? Vulnerability, misconfiguration, et cetera? 
in the case of vaccine, it's, it's always been a vulnerability. Um, you know, there is and there will continue to be a time between when a vulnerability is publicly disclosed and when any enterprise is able to, um, you know, efficiently patch their public-facing servers. Uh, that's just the way it is because understand, understandably every business has to go through a testing process to ensure that they don't negatively impact their business operations uh, with a new patch. And so, um, you know, within that window of time, which could be anywhere from a few days to weeks or months, um, you know, there's ample time for a vulnerability to be exploited. Uh, and of course, if you're talking about a zero day, well, in that case, no one even knows about it up front. And so until someone realizes that the attack is taking place, perhaps through some other detection mechanism, uh, the attacker can basically, uh, at their leisure, interact with that server. OK, uh, looks like we had another one come in. Uh, did the presenter see web shells that can escape egress rules using DNS? Sorry, Trevor, can you repeat that one more time? Uh, did the presenter see web shells that can escape egress rules using DNS? Yeah, I mean, ingress and egress rules can, can certainly be helpful and are, and are is one way that you can filter out traffic associated with web shells. Um, but the problem is if this is, uh, you know, this is generally a compromise on a public facing server uh, that has a web server on it that other legitimate users are trying to access and the attacker can always come from a different IP um, if one were to block a particular group of IPs. And so while filtering uh, can be helpful for a particular attack, um, there are always creative ways for the adversary to get around it. OK, uh, is it possible to obfuscate JSP shells by changing their file extension and directing the web server to execute them as JSP? Um, you know, changing the file extensions alone I, I don't think would be a very good approach to trying to obfuscate them. Um, we talked about a number of host capabilities that don't really worry too much about the actual extension but focus on, for example, uh, the actual functions that are being used within that page. Um, other capabilities that focus on hex pattern matching or other strings would also be helpful in detecting it. So um, feel free to ask the question again if I'm not really answering it. But I, I don't think changing the extension alone would be uh, considered obfuscation in this case. OK, uh, another one. I'd like to know your opinion about the solution on Nix with Apache PHP.ini with disable functions, system, uh, P-O-P-E-N, D-L, pass-through, uh, and shell exec. I can I'm not familiar it. with that. I'm not familiar with that specific approach, but um, if you wouldn't mind emailing me after. I'd love to talk to you about it. Okay, and that looks like it was the last question. So with that, I would like to say thank you so much to Anuj for your great presentation and for bringing this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived webcasts, visit sans.org forward slash webcast. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast. All right, thank you all.